Hello and welcome back. So what we're going to talk about in this next section is just a little more about the nucleus and kind of what holds it together and why it does what it does. But then we're going to go into talking about how we detect radiation and more specifically about the kinetics of radiation and what that can do for us. So let's talk briefly about what holds a nucleus together. If you ever thought about this and you're like, hey, I've got this nucleus and this nucleus is tiny and it's got a bunch of protons in it and it's got a bunch of neutrons in it. And this very, very, very tiny nucleus has these protons all scrunched together. And this proton is right essentially in contact with this proton next to it. But haven't we said so many times that one of the strongest forces in the visible universe <coughs> is the charge, attraction and charge repulsion force. So those positive charges, those nuclei should just be throwing each other away. And we really should only have hydrogen in the world because everybody should be decaying and falling apart. And we shouldn't have anything because those positive positively charged neutrons or positively charged protons should really just be repelling each other so much and all nuclei should fall apart. But obviously that doesn't happen. So there's something more powerful than the electrostatic attraction. And what could that more powerful thing be? And it turns out we call it the strong force, right? And yes, it might be a little bit like Yoda, but even stronger because it's happening so strongly that it's overcoming one of the strongest forces we know of in the visible universe, which is the electrostatic repulsion force. It's overcoming that. These guys are attracted by this thing called the strong force, which only works at extraordinarily small distances, such as in a nucleus. If you separate them by just a little, that strong force weakens so quickly that those things would fly apart. And so that's why it's really hard to push two nuclei together. You can't really do that very easily. But once they're together, they're actually very, very stable because the strong force holds them together. Now it turns out the strong force also holds neutrons next to protons, but you're not actually there limited by the repulsion forces and it holds neutrons to neutrons. So you've got a lot of strong force here, but with no repulsion. You've got a lot of strong force here, but with no repulsion. So it seems like from this argument, if you just keep adding neutrons to an element, the more neutrons, the merrier, because you're getting strong force attraction, strong force attraction, strong force attraction, and you're not getting these repulsions. So it should just be, you know, great that we should have you know, as many neutrons as possible. But we saw in the value of stability that wasn't true. There was kind of an upper limit to the number of neutrons. And then if it was above that, something would undergo nuclear radioactive decay in order to try to get down to a better ratio of neutrons to protons. Why is that? And again, that comes from the quantized levels of the neutrons. Right? We're talking about neutrons existing only in certain levels. So as you start to fill your neutrons in here, every neutron that you fill in additionally has to go to a higher energy level. And yes, there is some great factor that we get from the strong force reducing the energy in our system, but eventually you're adding neutrons to such a high energy level, because there's only certain energy levels available to them, that it overcomes and overpowers that strong force. And you're like, I don't want to add any more neutrons. And where that is, is roughly around 1.25 to 1. Okay. So that's why we have these ratios, these values of stability, is it comes from the balance of this strong force with the quantized neutrons. The strong force is holding it together. The quantized neutrons are saying, hey, I can't add forever because I'm adding at higher and higher energy. So that always bothered me too as an introductory student. Is, hey, why doesn't the nucleus just fall apart with all these really, really strong electrostatic repulsions happening inside the nucleus? And it's just because of the strong force. So something undergoes radioactive decay and you want to figure out what it's doing and where it is. So one of the most common things you're going to see in movies is people walking around with devices that look like that and they're pointing at things and it's going tick, 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 and when they do that, they're going, ah, screaming because everyone's going to die. Well, it turns out that is an alpha particle detector. And so that alpha particle detector is just detecting alpha particles. It's called a Geiger counter made by the person who uh, eventually uh, created it. And all it does is, is the alpha particle comes in and there's a very, very highly charged anode in here. There's a very highly charged cathode in here. And the um, 
the, the particles come in and they interact with the charges there. And when they hit the side, they release a bunch of electrons, which then get amplified and you get tick. That's all that's happening is you have these particles hitting the side, releasing electrons. Those electrons get amplified into an electrical signal and you hear a tick. So every time you hear a tick, that means there was one alpha particle, right? Four to helium that went inside. Now, why would that helium do anything? Well, it turns out that helium was ejected without any electrons. So the helium actually has a two plus charge. Nobody ever writes that. Nobody ever worries about electron and charge balancing in nuclear reactions, but it does. It has a plus two charge. So it's a highly charged ion, and that's why when it hits the side, it releases a bunch of electrons. And that's how a Geiger counter works. But it turns out alpha particles are by far the least deadly or the least harmful of any of the particles that are getting emitted from things. So when people start to panic about all these alpha particles, it really is. It turns out you can, you can protect yourself from alpha particles by, you know, a piece of paper. So, you know, you, you take your little mask and you put that on. Your face is now protected by alpha particles. Okay. So it's not really that big of a deal unless you have extraordinarily high levels of alpha particle emissions. Okay. Nobody should be screaming or things like that. But how do we detect um, the higher energy ones? How do we detect things that have really high energy? And it turns out there's all sorts of different ways to do it. Um, one of which is by using what's called a scintillation counter. And a, what's scintillation? It turns out it's light. And these really fast ones or gamma rays or things like that, they're actually really, really hard to capture or beta particles. Um, the beta particles aren't too bad because they're charged, but things like gamma, I mean, how, how are you going to gather something about gamma? But the beta particles are hard too. So what you do is use a scintillation detector. And in a scintillation detector, you might have something like sodium iodide or cesium iodide. And this iodine, if you look at iodine, it's pretty far down on the periodic table. And what that means is it's very large and has a lot of electrons. And those outer electrons on the iodine, right, we've got all the different shells, those outer electrons on the iodine are fairly loosely held because they're so far from the nucleus. Which means as something goes by that has some energy that might interact with that, it can move these electrons a little bit and wiggle them around, essentially. And those electrons wiggling around, maybe it's going to move to the next highest level. And when it moves to the next highest level, it might then move back down and release a little bit of light that we can see. And that's what a scintillation detector does. It uses the movement of those loosely bound electrons in something like an iodine in order to be able to see the passing by of maybe some high energy things, things that are hard to capture, but that as they pass by, right, you can feel the wind of the runner passing by you even if you can't catch them because they're so fast. That's essentially what a scintillation detector is doing. So, what we're really going to talk about in this video is kinetics. What are the kinetics of nuclear chemistry? And it turns out all nuclear chemistry is first order kinetics. We get, we get the rate is just equal to K times essentially the number of particles that we have that are radioactive, and that's to the first power. Okay? We remember when we had first order kinetics, we talked about the half life, and we said, oh, that was 0 0.693 over my rate constant k. We talked about the equation. Right? This is our first order rate equation. We talked about concentrations when we originally did this. But concentrations of nuclear particles we don't generally talk about. We talk about just raw number in general. Or turns out raw number is essentially the same thing in terms of uh, ratios as uh, how much radiation is coming off. So you can talk about how much radiation is coming off. So you can talk about the number of radioactive particles. And so I'm going to just put that here, ln of n at t. So the number of radioactive particles or the rate of radioactive emission, which is directly proportional to the number of particles, is equal to minus kt plus the natural log of how many we had at the beginning. Now, for whatever reason, historically, most people in regular kinetics use this form of the equation, but most people in nuclear kinetics use this form of the equation. Either is correct. Right? Obviously, they are just algebraic manipulations of one another, but by far, more people are going to use that bottom one than the other one. So how does that help us? Well, the first thing we need to do is think a little bit about some of our k values. How, what, what kind of <laughs> 
half-lives are we getting? And again, for whatever reason, when people do regular chemical kinetics, they almost always talk about K, the rate constant. And when people are doing nuclear kinetics, they almost always talk about T1 half, the half-life. And remember, there's just a relationship with, between them. T1 half is 0.693 over K, so you can always convert between one and the other. But let's look at some naturally occurring isotopes and some medical isotopes. Naturally occurring, carbon-14, you're gonna, you've heard about that before, and we're going to talk about that next. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. And that, that's a pretty darn long time when you're a human being and only live for less than 100 years or so. 5,730 years. What that means is if I had 10 grams of carbon-14 sitting there, I'd have to wait 5,730 years before half of that carbon-14 had spontaneously decayed into nitrogen-14 via the beta decay that it does. And then in 5,730 years, I'd have essentially five grams of carbon-14, and I'd have five grams of nitrogen-14. And so that takes a very, very, very long time. However, when you compare that to something like potassium-40, which has a half-life of about 1.3 times 10 to the ninth year, so 1.3 billion years, that 5,730 doesn't look so long anymore, does it? You can see other ones, radium-226, 1,600 years, strontium-90, 38 years, uranium-238, one of the ones we've talked about very early on with the uh, decay series, four and a half billion years, which is roughly an estimate of the age of the Earth, which means that the uranium that was present when the Earth was formed, there's only about half of it left. Okay, so and in another four and a half billion years, there'll be a half of that left, so only about 25% of the original amount. So some of these naturally occurring isotopes have very, very long half-lives, right? The uranium-238, there's still a bunch here from the creation of the Earth, but uh, Carbon-14, 5,730 years, you'd think that you know, if the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, there'd be none left, right? Because you, know, you divide 4.5 billion times divide by 5,730, it's a huge number of half-lives. You take one half to that power, and your calculator's just going to tell you zero, because that's essentially what it is. But there is still carbon-14 in the world, so we got to figure out where is that coming from. I also wanted to briefly talk about this bottom half of this table, which is medical isotopes. I want you to notice a couple things about the medical isotopes. Chromium-51, 28 days. Iodine-131, 8 days. Radon-222, 3 days. Technetium-99M. M just stands for metastable. So it's technetium-99, and they kind of bumped one of the neutrons to make it not so stable. Six hours. Six hours. Very, very small. But you compare naturally occurring isotopes with thousands of years or billions of years to these medical isotopes with days or hours. Why is there a big difference there? Remember, these medical isotopes are often used for either diagnostic purposes or for treatment purposes for things like cancer and stuff. And what do you do, right? You, you ingest or get injected with these radioactive isotopes, and you're now radioactive. Like I, I knew someone who had an iodine test and they got sent home with a letter that said, for a while, I need you to avoid being around young people and old people. And uh, you know, I thought it was funny because they were an old people. But uh, you're, you're just a walking bag of radiation. You don't want to be a walking bag of radiation for very long. And so that's why one of the reasons that we have these very short half-lives is so that your radiation disappears from your body very, very quickly turns out you pee out most of it okay so most of it's just excreted from your normal waste processes but some of it is maintained in your body and you want that to decay relatively quickly the other reason we want fairly quick decay processes is so that we can detect it right if you're decaying over 10 you know over four and a half billion years the amount that's decaying at any given time is actually relatively small and it's going to be hard to detect but if you're decaying over the course of days or hours, the amount that's decaying at any given time is actually much, much larger. And so it's going to be easy to detect, or you can use a smaller quantity of it and still be able to detect it. And right, anytime you're dealing with radioactive materials, you do kind of want to minimize quantities. So those are the reasons those, those medical applications are, uh, have much smaller concentrations or much smaller, uh, shorter half-lives. And you can look up the different uh, things that... Uh, those isotopes uh, are used for, like chromium and iron are used for, I think, generally heart uh, type stuff, iodine-131 for thyroid, and you can look up some of the other ones. So we're going to talk specifically about carbon dating right now. And if you know anything about carbon dating, it's generally used to date things that were once alive. 
So we used it for paper. We used it for you know samples of, of decaying uh, um, cotton or things. Something that was once alive. Why? Well, because it turns out that things that are once alive are constantly intaking carbon-14. And so if we're constantly intaking carbon-14, then there's a bunch of it in us, right? So you actually have carbon-14 in you because you are constantly intaking things because you're alive. I know you're alive because you're watching my video. So you're constantly intaking carbon-14, which means you have a bunch of radioactive carbon-14 in you that is constantly decaying and emitting beta particles. So you are a beta particle emitter. Oh, does it feel good? Okay, so you're a beta particle emitter. But once you die, or once the tree dies, or once whatever dies, it no longer takes in carbon-14. It's now just decaying. And so by knowing something about how much something living should have in it, and we compare it to how much it has in it now, we can make an estimate of when did this thing die. Was it 5,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago? And carbon-14 dating turns out you can do it pretty well over three or four half-lives, so you know things that are about 20,000 years old. And you can even do it up to about five, six, seven half-lives now. We're getting really, really good at that. So you can do things that are maybe 30, 40,000 years old, dating them with carbon dating. And the thing you really have to worry about with carbon dating is whether it's contamination, right? Because a little bit of a sample of fresh living stuff, like some bacteria and stuff getting on there, is really going to mess, especially if you're looking at very old samples that have very little radioactive material left in them. So you do have to worry about contamination with carbon-14 dating. However, the one thing we have to figure out is with carbon-14 dating, if the half-life is 5,730 years, there really shouldn't be any carbon-14 left on Earth. So if we draw our favorite little planet down here at the bottom, and we've got Earth there, and we're going to have our little blue sky on top of there, and way out here in the far away is our sun, it turns out the sun is always emitting a huge number of cosmic rays down into the Earth, and most of it's stopped by our upper atmosphere. But it turns out in that upper atmosphere, there's a lot of chemistry going on, and some of these high energy cosmic rays will actually form carbon-14 up in the atmosphere. They're high enough energy that they can do that. That carbon-14 then kind of runs around the atmosphere and eventually finds some oxygen and turns into CO2 that is isotopically labeled as carbon-14. So isotopically labeled means it's got a different than normal isotope, right? The normal isotope of carbon is 12. So isotopically labeled carbon-14 just says, hey, I've got some CO2 there that's um, carbon-14. So it floats around, right? And then it comes down here. And what on Earth likes to take in carbon dioxide? Well, that's our lovely little friends, trees and, oops, not fire trees and bushes and things. So if I've got a, a little bush down here, he's going to be constantly intaking some of that carbon-14 and making it part of the structure of the tree. And so that tree has carbon-14 in it, right? And then a cow comes. I'm not going to draw a cow because I can't. But a cow comes and eats that. And now a cow takes in that carbon-14. It has a constant amount of carbon-14 in it. And then we eat the cow for those of us who like to eat cow, which is definitely me. And we eat the cow until we get the carbon-14, or we eat the plant directly for those who don't eat cows, and you get the carbon-14 from there. And so that's how all these living creatures get the carbon-14, and it is from the process of photosynthesis and the intake of carbon dioxide into plants. And because the sun is a pretty constant shiner, and it's giving out pretty constant amount of cosmic rays, it's producing a pretty constant amount of carbon-14, which gets a pretty constant amount of carbon-14 into living species, which is why we know how much should be in there. And then we can detect how much is in there by saying, hey, let me detect all the radiation. There's only about half as much radiation coming out of here as there should be if it was alive. And so if there's half as much, this thing's about 5,730 years old. If there is quarter as much, this thing is about 10,460 or 11,460 years old. So we can do that kind of math and figure out how old things are by looking at the radiation coming off now versus the radiation coming off beforehand. So right, if you want to know, carbon-14 in a plant is about one part per trillion. So one in every 10 to the 12th carbon atoms is carbon-14.
So that roughly one gram of um, of uh, carbon in there is going to contain about a picogram of carbon 14. So let's do some kinetics. Let's do some kinetics here and say that um, we're going to say that we've got a, a sample. And it only has 0 0.15. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 sorry. I was going to do an example. I, I, I decided I'm going to save my example for the uh, next slide because I realized on the next slide I already had an example set up. So my apologies for that. Okay, I just got confused because I, I wasn't reading my notes properly. So what are we going to do? We've got a carbon-14 that's got a half-life 5,730 years. So we had a sample that we know originally would contain 36.95, or sorry, 36.5 nanograms of carbon-14. Again, we know that because we can look at the size of the sample and, and make some estimates about how much carbon-14 should be in there. And, but now we know it's only got 6.89 nanograms. We don't know how old is this. All right. So what are we going to do? Well, first thing, if we're going to use our equation that says the natural log of nt over n naught equals minus kt, is we need to find k. We're going to find k by using t one half equals 0 0.693 over k, and that's 5,730 years is 0.693 over k. And if you do that math, you get that k equals 1.209 times 10 to the minus fourth per year. Okay, so we can substitute that in there. And so we get ln of nt, that's 6.89 nanograms, over our starting, which was 36.5 nanograms. And you'll notice the units cancel out here, which they have to because it's the ratio of logs or it, it's a log, so the units have to cancel out, which means that we can use any unit we want here that's directly proportional to the amount that we have. That's why I said I could use nanograms, I could use grams, I could use radioactive, um, the, the amount of radioactivity, so a measure of the radioactivity, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Measure of radioactivity has my thing there, and this is gonna be minus 1.209 times 10 to the minus fourth per year times t. Right? That's just a plug and chug. You plug those two numbers into your calculator, you divide by a negative 1.209 times 10 to the minus fourth, and you get that t is approximately 1.38 times 10 to the fourth years, or about 13,800 years old. Okay, 13,800 years old. So that's what the things, kind of things we can do with carbon dating, is we can use the ratios in order to figure out the time, or we can you know, use the time to figure out the ratio, whatever. It's very, very similar to what we did in our first chapter in this class, which was kinetics, but now we're doing it in terms of radioactivity and counts instead of concentration. So that works great if you've got something that was once alive, or eight things that was once alive, and you're talking about thousands or tens of thousands of years old. But what if you're trying to date things like rocks? What if you're trying to figure out things that are hundreds of thousands of years old, or millions of years old, or billions of years old? How could you possibly figure that out? And it turns out what you're gonna do is you're gonna use what's called uranium and lead dating. As you remember a couple times we've talked about now, uranium-238 eventually decays into um, lead 206. Lead 206 is a stable isotope. Uranium 238 is an unstable isotope. There's nothing that creates uranium 238. So the uranium 238 that's on our planet is the stuff that was there when the planet was formed, whenever that was. Okay? Now, our estimates of that date is about four and a half billion years ago. So there's roughly half as much uranium 238 now as there was at the beginning, and the rest of that's turned into lead. Now, for reasons I'm not entirely sure of, geologists tell us that when rocks form, they generally form using uranium, but not so much lead. 
I'm not going to question that one. Okay, but we, uh, we're going to use that to our advantage to try to maybe date a rock. And so let's say that we look at a rock and we're going to look at this rock and we're going to look at the ratio of uranium-238 and lead. And we're going to say lead-206 to uranium-238. If it was four and a half billion years old, right, that would be a ratio of about one to one, right? We said about half of the uranium in the world has decayed because our Earth is about four and a half billion years old. But in this case, it is 0 0.115. Okay, so 0 0.115. So we're saying we have a lot less lead than we would if it was four and a half billion years old. So we think that this thing is less than four and a half billion years old. Now I'm going to write this as a fraction. It's 115 out of 1,000 for reasons we'll see in just a moment. All right, what are we going to do? We're going to use our kinetic stuff to try to figure out something. So the first thing we're going to need to do is figure out where our k value is. Our t1 half is 0 0.693 over k. Our k for uranium, or our uh, half-life, for uranium-238 was four and a half billion years. So it's gonna be 0 0.693 over 4.5 times 10 to the ninth years. And if you do that math, I apparently forgot to write down that answer, is 0.693 divided by 4.5 times 10 to the ninth. That is gonna be 1.54 times 10 to the minus 10th per year. That's my k value, 1.54 times 10 to the minus 10th per year. Now, here's where it gets a tiny bit tricky. Our ratio right now is that there's 115 to 1,000. So right in this rock that we have, there's 115 leads to every 238 uraniums. If we go back in time, 100% of that lead, right? Oops, 115, I wrote 238, for every 1,000 uraniums, sorry. 115 leads for every 1,000 uraniums, that's what that ratio means. Okay, so if we go back in time, all of that lead came from uranium. So when back in time, we're saying we had zero lead, but how many uraniums did we have? We had 1,115 uraniums because all of those leads back in time were once uraniums. So looking back in time, we had zero leads and I have 1,115 uraniums. That's why we wrote that as a ratio, uh, just because it makes some of this math a little bit easier to think about. So if we're going to use our natural log of nt over n naught equals minus kt for uranium, we can't use it for lead, right? We can now have nt and we have n naught. So we're going to say natural log of 1,000 over 1,115 equals minus 1.54 times 10 to the minus 10th per year times t. And we can figure out t that way. And that t is going to be about 7.2, sorry, 7.1 times 10 to the 8th years, or about 710 million years. All right, so that's an interesting thing to be able to do. We're going to take ratios of lead and uranium in things. And again, I'm not going to I'm not going to question my geologist buddies on here that there's not going to be much lead in these rocks when they're formed, and uh, it's all going to be uranium. So we've got uranium; it turns into lead over time. The hardest part of this one that's not directly related to any of the kinetics we've done, it's kind of like a Bryce table, right? It's kind of like a here's what happened before, but we're working backwards to find the before. Okay, so it's a little bit like that, with the BRI part. And then we can plug into our kinetics equation and solve for T, which we've done many times before. Right, so that the trickiest one about the lead and uranium is doing that backwards calculation to figure out how much uranium there was at the beginning so we can use that in our kinetics first order integrated rate law. All right.
Hopefully we've learned something in this chapter about the kinetics of nuclear radioactive decay, and also a little bit we learned about the strong force and also a tiny bit about how to detect radiation. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day.